this is the moment I love the most in this project. The release of newts back into a wetland. These endangered striped newts are resting in the palms of my five-year-old son's hands. Max is joining a group of kids to help the Coastal Plains Institute, a family operation, reintroduce this species to the Munson Sand Hills region of the Apalachicola National Forest. This part of the forest is well known to trail users of all kinds. How you doing? How are you? Ryan Means never wastes an opportunity to educate the public. They live most of their lives in the uplands as terrestrial salamanders, eating insects, eating worms, eating whatever they can shove down their gullet. And then when the proper season and the proper rain occurs, they get frisky and they get ready to return to their natal wetland. They'll go down there and party and pair up and lay eggs. This pond is an ephemeral wetland. Its water level rises and falls with the fullness of the aquifer underneath it. Not long ago, this natural cycle was disrupted. We have been very recently here in the Tallahassee area in a long droughty period that lasted nearly 20 years. Some might argue that we're still in it. A drought has a consequence in that area wetlands would be dry for a lot more of the time than they normally would be. We believe that ties into the potential local extinction of the striped newt because there have been fewer and fewer opportunities for things like striped newts to breed in these wetlands. Repatriating the newts is no simple process. Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens has produced these newts and they're at the ripe age to now release back into one of our selected recipient wetlands. Every one of them has a unique mark on its belly. Through mark recapture, we'll be able to tell a great deal about the life histories of these newts. Before they're marked, they're put in the dream potion. Total length is 67. 1.3 grams. The tagging is done by Florida Fish and Wildlife's Pearson Hill. <laughs> Several years ago, Pearson dyed his own knuckles. So this one's a red one, and an orange two, and a blue three, and a red four. So we'll wait till they regain their consciousness and they'll go home with the rest of them. Another tool helps them keep track of newts as they leave and return to the pond. Anything that is small and walks along the ground and has trouble climbing can now run into the fence, boom, and wonder why there's a barrier there. That thing will walk along the edge of the fence and eventually go plop right into a bucket. Just a mail for you, and you may go. You are now going to release these nets back into their well. I'll tell you what, there's a predator nearby. Look. Oh, oh that's perfect. Look at that. January, we released approximately 123 adult striped newts here in the Apalachicola National Forest. It's April now and we've been in place with our drift fences here trying to measure and monitor what those newts have been doing in the wetland. Today, Ryan has some help on the fences. Today we had a middle school class from Cobb Middle School come down and join us. This one is called Asclepius humistrata. It's a sandhills milkweed. It was a wonderful time. We've been doing this for a couple of years now for Cobb. On the way to the pond, the class gets to know the longleaf ecosystem where striped newts spend most of their time. At this white-banded tree, they learn of another species of interest. It's called the red cockaded woodpecker. That woodpecker is a resident of this longleaf pine forest. So that's why it's not. And it happens to be a federally endangered species, okay? Lacking mature longleaf pine in which to make cavities, the woodpeckers rely on artificial boxes. Other species, like this great crested flycatcher, find them pretty useful as well. It's awesome to have you guys here, and so I want you to experience today 
a, an, an ongoing scientific conservation project. Oh my god! It's a The smallest toad in North America. It's called the oak toad. <laughs> and it's so called because its body kind of looks like the color of an oak tree. Oh, yeah, it does. Outstanding work, buddy. We're targeting striped newts, of course, with this fence, but we capture well over a hundred species of invertebrates, vertebrates, anything that's moving terrestrially along the ground. It offers amazing opportunities for education, naturalist activities, learning area species. Ornate porous frog that has frogs? lost its tail already. The kids, they get off the bus, and they're like, we're going out in the woods. Are there bears? Are there lions? And by the end of the field trip, they're running through the woods. They're eating oh, wow. Smilax wow. tips. They're getting wet in the wetlands. Yep. And oh, you know. they love amphibians by the time it's over. So That may be the greatest part of this project. Oh, they didn't find any newts today, but that's OK. After six years of the project, Ryan and Rebecca have evidence that previous year's newts are returning to breed. There's still a long road to a sustainable striped newt population. Until then, the Coastal Plains Institute will be looking to continue their repatriation efforts. And they'll do so with the help of partners, friends, and a new generation of conservationists. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz, De Villegas.